Thanks again for, uh, for having me uh, here at, uh, at Redeemer for our conference. We've got our, our last session here, and uh, what I want to do is, is kind of move this not only into the uh, Divine Liturgy, uh, but also into our, uh, hopefully, uh, daily, weekly lives. So, uh, God, it is God who sanctifies His people. God sets us apart. He is the one who makes us holy. And as we gather, as we just have in the divine service, this is evident uh, from the very beginning. We touched a little bit on this yesterday, but from the very beginning, uh, as uh, the first words we hear in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we remember and take confidence and assurance that we are God's set apart through the waters of holy baptism. Uh, we've seen our world continue to kick and scream and yell uh, all at once as to who uh, they think we are as Christians, but we were reminded right from the very beginning that we are uh, God's baptized, God's set apart. That is our identity now. So what happens as we gather is different than anything the world sees. It's different than anything the world can offer. That's why the inside of God's holy place looks different. It sounds different. It smells different very often. There's no place like it on earth, for it is truly heaven come down to us. That's why it needs to remain set apart in this way. The church does not need to be dressed up to be more attractive. She does not need to be paraded around or advertised as to be on the market to be sold. That instead is the vocation of a prostitute. God's church is His bride cleansed and purified by the blood of Jesus. This is His set-apart body to which you belong. The things of the world need not enter in and defile. So as we gather as God's set apart, He comes to us to cleanse us once more through the absolution. He sends His Spirit to call you once again by the gospel and enlighten you with His gifts. Through that word and promise, He's keeping you in the faith just as He did Abraham and Moses before you, as even they constantly were asking God to reassure them once more of your promise. You remember Moses in the wilderness, Moses on Sinai? If you're not going with us, I'm not going. So you better be coming with us. Tell me once again you're coming. And then as the service goes, you're further set apart in the sacrament of the altar. Historically, the prayer of the church was the prayer of dismissal, God's people further being set apart, set apart with the same words as before, the Lord be with you. Heaven then joins earth in song as we receive the body and blood of the Lamb of God who was slain, the blood that sets us free to be people of God, and by it the wrath of God passes over us and continues to pass over us in the sacrament. And we end then just as we began. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. And we don't say that because it's nice to kind of bring the Old Testament in. Again, it isn't said because we like to pretend like we're Aaron at this point. But listen to this. Aaronic benediction in context in Numbers chapter 6. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel and you shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them so shall they put my name upon the people of Israel. 
just like we started, is the same way we end. It's all about God's name, God's name upon you in your baptism, God's name upon you in benediction. It's God's own name written upon your foreheads and upon your hearts that mark you as His own, as His set apart and make you who you are, His holy, His sanctified. Now, I know the pandemic hit some places much harder than others in regards to lockdown and what, uh, frankly, Babylon said you could or couldn't do as Christians on a Sunday. Now, I've talked to many pastors, as I'm sure you are, who lost the majority of their people to watching videos online. Or maybe they were already headed out the door and used this as an opportunity to not come back at all. As a result of this, there will be the tendency and increased pressure, especially upon our young guys, to change things up a bit. Right? Now is not the time to talk about closed communion. We don't need any more of that traditional stuff. If we lose any more people and don't start getting some more new ones in, well, that's going to affect the bottom line. And if the bottom line is affected, well, you know what that means for you. So there will be the temptation to open the door to the things of the world rather than to simply proclaim His Word, trust His providence, and go forward in that proclamation of the Word. All of us need to be on guard here, whether we're here in Fort Wayne and Milwaukee or Detroit or Coleman, wherever we are. The devil would love nothing more than for us to start intermingling with the world again, to bring those things into the things that are holy, the things that are set apart, just like the wicked kings who come who have come before us, whose idolatry, wickedness, led the people into exile in the first place. This is an interesting thing, too. As we notice kind of the way the world functions, the way the people of the world work, you know, even if people aren't Christian, they still have a tendency to want to set themselves apart. Just, of course, not by God. Again, this is one of the things that uh, you might say is a coincidence or speculation or that it has no bearing on one another. And it's not something that I thought much about until the last decade or so. Let's go back in our history as a nation, in the United States, to around the early 1900s. As a country, we had come through the Great War, And we roared into the 20s. Evil had been eradicated, right? And we were booming again. But then the Great Depression hit. And what had been thriving now lay in ruin. And on top of that, as history would go along, there was a man who followed Friedrich Nietzsche's playbook to a T. And he rose up into power, and he had the way to get Germany out of their economic turmoil. He rose through the ranks and became Germany's saving ubermensch. The Treaty of Versailles? Well, what's that? We don't have to obey. That's the thing that caused our depression in the first place. So against that treaty, an army was formed, land was taken back, And the rest of the world simply began their time of appeasement. And as a result of no one doing anything about it, Germany rose to power. Except to say that we weren't doing anything about it at all might be a little bit unfaithful because those of the world were doing something about it. We, as a nation, were doing something about about it. We had set ourselves apart in a different way 
Now, this is not a case for or against isolationism. This is more of the attention in what we bought into to make extra sure that we were set apart from all that stuff going on in the world. While Hitler was beginning to plan his invasion of Poland and the slaughter of millions, we in our country made sure that we had our own Ubermensch in place. And on June 30th, 1938, it was not a bird, it was not a plane, but it was Superman, Ubermensch who was revealed to the world in Action Comics number one. I bring this to your attention because I don't believe it's any coincidence at all, the movement and everything that's happening today. We're seeing the world spiral more and to more uh, into craziness. And what has been the response in the last 10 or 15 years? We've seen the revival of Marvel and DC movies a new one every year. It's become a billion dollar industry. Now again, there's nothing wrong with enjoying a little Batman. But it is our tendency when evil makes its play for people to set themselves apart in the realm of, in the realm of fantasy. I mean, some of these movies that are coming out, who, who even knew these characters existed? But it doesn't matter. They make millions at the box office. On top of that, look at the gaming industry and what is popular. I feel like my grandparents back in the day, you know, you need to stay away from those games. But look at the games that are popular today. They're role-playing games. You make a character and you enter into a different world. And that different world maybe uh, 15 or 20 years ago was the land of complete fantasy of trolls and orcs and things like this, but that's not the way it is now. This is actual, uh, an alternate society where people get jobs, interact with others, do whatever you want. And then, on top of that, there are people who will sit at their computers and watch these other people sit at their computers and play those games. Just a complete uh, backing out of reality, but it's fantasy. It's not real. Don't even get us going, right, on the metaverse. This is being set apart in the wrong way. But these are the desirable things of the world right now, and by it, by the church getting sucked up into all of this, especially with COVID and watching videos online on Sundays or Mondays or Tuesdays instead of actually showing up, the church, the body of Christ, has become disembodied and separated. But we in the church are not separated, set apart in some fantasy. We've been sanctified in the real body of Christ. We're not the church when we're watching videos online. That's like watching someone on TV eat and pretend like you can smell it, taste it, and are satisfied by it. Instead, we're set apart from all of that and come together for what's real, to taste and to see that the Lord is good. Now, we do remain set apart even outside of Sunday. Consider Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego once again. It wasn't just the Sabbath that Babylon wanted from them. It was their whole lives in the same way we see the world, it's not just Sunday they want from us. They want the whole thing. Let it all go. So it's important that we don't just gather on Sundays and go running headlong into the world to blend in with it Monday through Saturday. This distinction, this setting apart, is to be realized always. Now while some, and, and this uh, even came up uh, back on Monday, uh, there's maybe a thought that we should withdraw from society completely. Not only is that unrealistic, it's uh, perhaps even unfaithful, right? We've been called to be the salt of the earth, not to just completely withdraw ourselves. We've been called to make disciples of all nations. 
Paul does address the Corinthians saying, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters. Since then you would need to go out of the world. So as Jesus said, we are in the world, we are just not of the world. Now one major area, and you kind of knew where it was headed on Monday, right? One major area that we need to reclaim, and many in our Senate have already been faithful in doing so, is our schools. While some or all of you might say that you're too old for school, or might have children that are already grown or grandchildren that are no longer of school age or don't even have a Lutheran school in your area, I would highly suggest finding one. Not necessarily finding one and moving to one, but finding one. Find the ones that are faithful and support them. The work that they're doing to prepare our children to live faithfully in this world is priceless. Our children for too long have forsaken the language of God and have learned the language of Ashdod as in the days of Nehemiah. They need to relearn the language and the ritual of God. But you know, you're fully aware that faithfulness is not the case with all of our Lutheran schools. It's the problem in some of our preschools all the way to our Concordias. And I'm probably going to speak freely, a little too freely at some point. I'll try to stay behind the podium. But nothing, nothing that's going to be said is revolutionary. Nothing is like I'm pulling behind or pulling the curtain away and showing you things that you don't already know are going on. Our schools, just like Sunday, are for our children. And just like Sunday, that's not to say that nobody else can come along, right? In our place, we've seen many children and parents alike be separated through the waters of holy baptism as a result of the proclamation of the Word through our school. But what has happened is that instead of being a light into the world, our schools have married themselves to the world as so many have done in the Scriptures before us out of fear of losing tuition dollars or not being able to meet the budget, or maybe having a contentious voters' assembly, you rarely see anyone take a stand anymore when it comes to making sure that the truth is taught, that chapel is reverent, and that religion classes are in order. And even more, that the Scriptures are the driving force behind the entire mission rather than an added extra. Now, I can't. I wish I could, but I can't stand here and act like we've got everything in order at St. Paul's in Coleman. We fall into the same traps that many others do, especially in communities that are similar to ours. Coleman had been voted a couple of years ago the number one place in Alabama to raise a family. And I won't go into all the specifics like a Chamber of Commerce spokesman would as to give you the reasons why, but our schools were actually uh, one of the reasons for this. Our schools in Coleman have always been ranked in the top ten, very often the top five in our state. They are considered a blue ribbon school system. Now, St. Paul's sits right in the heart of Old Downtown, directly across the road from one of the other elementary schools. And from the standpoint of the community, that, not us, that across the street is the school to go to. That's where you make friends. That's where you not only learn to play sports, but you get to know the in crowd so that you're selected for the best teams. Publicly, you're doing a disservice to your children by not sending them there. And there's even another public elementary school in town across the tracks. Teach the same thing. Everything is exactly the same, but it's still not the school. So parents will make sure that they live on the right side of town so that they can get into that 
school. So where do we fit in? Where did we fit in? Well, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and began to take any as they chose as their wives. Even some within our own congregation, our own parishioners, will still see us as in competition with them. We need to be to their standard. We need teachers like them. We need activities like them. We need blue ribbons like them. Give us a king so that we're like all the nations. We became like the nations. So in days gone by, adjustments were made to become like them. They have the latest technology. We want that. They have all the sports teams. We need those too. You know, and as for you, you're a little heavy on that Lutheran stuff. You chant a little too much in matins. Don't you know that barely any of our students are actually Lutheran anymore and only about a third of our teachers are? Ease up on the theology and the memorizing of the catechism and the matins. It'll turn them away. Now, what's interesting is that when we desired to be like them and made adjustments to become like them, our enrollment never increased. Our discipline problems did. Enrollment didn't, though. But why would it? We were no longer set apart. We had no identity. The school day became a free-for-all with no structure to it. You see, what people don't realize is that the surrounding schools can boast in everything they want to. They can hold their ribbons high and stand on the pedestal of their state-issued test scores. But even in little old deep red Coleman, Alabama, they still must hold to the state standard. And that blue color from the ribbon bleeds all over the pages of the textbooks and into the teacher's ideology. You still have to use preferred pronouns. There are still mixed bathrooms, although they call them something like multi-use or something like this. Now, one of our young ladies was uh, recently in, in catechism telling me about the cat people and the dog people and the horse people who get out of their cars in the mornings and wait for their groomers or owners to carry them around through the school day. Sixth graders at this chief school tell me of transgenderism. Why is that the standard? Why do we desire to be that? If Lutheran schools continue to want to be like their state counterparts, they will lose their identity, like all of the examples in the scriptures that have come before. We need to get out of the mindset that we're competing with those in the world. We're not. We're set apart from them. We have something that they can't give. Peace, forgiveness, the gospel that the Holy Spirit calls us by and sets us apart. This has been the downfall of our Concordia system, too. And I thank God for those who are remaining in the system and who are trying to remain faithful on these boards of regents who are desiring faithfulness. But it's probably beyond reform at this point. I pray that I'm wrong about that. But look at the system in the last three to five years. Why all the closures? Portland. Give us a king like all the nations. Bronxville. Give us one too. And where was the opposition? A few voices were out there. But most simply disappeared into a fantasy world and acted like it was no big deal. We would hate 
to deny these applications. We would hate to turn away these students. We're losing the opportunity to proclaim the gospel to them, the gospel that they need. Do you hate proclaiming the gospel? They need Jesus too. We're going to lose tuition money. We need the numbers. And we got the numbers, didn't we? And they all marched with more than blue ribbons, but red and orange and yellow, green, blue, and violet ones. It's funny, they always miss indigo, isn't it? Something about six being just short of seven. And they closed. The rest of them had better get on their game. I was at Seward in the first decade of the 2000s just for a few semesters to finish my undergraduate degree. And of course, hindsight is 2020. but I remember uh, being made to read a book in one of our general studies courses that was straight up CRT before CRT was a thing. And to make it worse, the professor made us to understand very clearly how privileged we were because she used to live in a place where she couldn't even flush the toilets. And it became our fault. And honestly, at the time, it felt like our fault. And we didn't know the difference we were being fed books in uh, religion classes, not taught by pastors, of course, but these books uh, concerning women's ordination and that this was the future of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And if you dare say anything in class about it, you had hell to pay. I was talking about this Concordia issue with some in my congregation, and I wanted to make it clear that there were a few holding on to faithfulness and others returning to faithfulness. And I commended in this conversation Concordia Chicago. And what did I see the next day? Some Looney Tune professor yelling and screaming as he was being carried off campus by the police. This has become our witness to the world. But who cares? It doesn't seem like we're about the gospel anymore anyway. We're about making money, balancing budgets, and of course, doing the typical LCMS thing and not wanting to ruffle any feathers. In typical LCMS fashion, we come on strong. It's like, we're about to say something. We're about to do something. And then we finish off nice and smooth saying, yeah, whatever works in your context. There's nothing sanctified, holy, and set apart about that at all. Instead, we cower like little paranoid King Saul's behind the luggage instead of standing against the enemy. I feel better. I know I had said earlier, and, and I've made a few connections to the intertestamental period to our current history, but you can make any connection that you wanted. The days of Noah, where the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, the wilderness and the mixed multitude, Babylon, the return during the days of Ezra and Nehemiah when the children only knew the language of Ashdod and not of God and His people, the early church battling Gnosticism, perhaps another topic for another time. But since I have referenced Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego so many times already, let's maybe stick or shift to Babylon. And just like with Babylon, it's not this direct, outright, full frontal attack on us. What Babylon does is make itself attractive because Babylon needs you to work for the kingdom, to work for the empire, to make Babylon better. Oh, you can still talk about God, but this is the way you have to talk about God. They see 
Babylon does. If we give just a little bit here and, and a little bit more over there, eventually we'll be fully blended, fully sold out. If you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to want a glass of milk. And then he's going to want the straw. So the more we give here and the more we give there, eventually Babylon says, now you've got to learn our language. It's Zim and Zir. See, Microsoft, Microsoft is full of bigots too because when I type Zim and Zir into the computer, it still puts a red line under it and says it's not a word. I wonder how long that will last. They and them read our literature, just like with Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. Did you know that you can go on Amazon right now and go into the LGBTQIA pi r squared section and you can click the best sellers and they'll give you a free trial. They don't give you free trials for theology books or anything like this. Free trial. Read it. We want it accessible. We want this literature in your hands. We cannot, as the church, as the set apart, as the sanctified of God, go along with this. Noah didn't. He walked with God and was set apart in the ark. Abram didn't. You know, Abram didn't bring the theology of Babylon, of the moon god, with him into the land. He was set apart from that. He believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. The same went for Isaac and Jacob and Judah after him. Judah, we didn't get much into him earlier. Talk about being set apart, set apart from his brothers who wanted to kill Joseph. He's the one who interfered. Judah, set apart from the others, he's the one who convinced his father to let Benjamin go back to Egypt with him. Judah could stand in front of his father Jacob and says, yeah, you know what it's like to lose two sons? I do too. Set apart from the rest. Moses stood firm in the wilderness even when he didn't want to. When God kind of shifted the language on him and said, what are these your people doing? Moses stood firm and said, no, these are your people. You've given them the promise. Moses faithfully stood firm all the way down the line. Even though we have been set apart from the world, we cannot withdraw from the world completely. Even if we were to withdraw for a time, maybe to re uh, remuster the troops, reunify the troops, get our game plan back together, so be it. But we cannot withdraw forever. We need to stand firm, and we need to know on what we stand. We stand on the very thing we confessed this past Sunday. Well, we did. We celebrated Philip and James, like, you know. A bit of college. I, I saw. <laughs> I saw, your, I saw your little collect. We stand, the, the epistle was written in Ephesians 2. We stand on the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. You will either be joined together by that cornerstone or you will be crushed by it. The Pharisees were crushed by it. Goliath was slain by it, but Israel was watered by it. And so shall we be when all things are new and the river of life flows once again. And we are delivered from the first and the greatest exile back into the new Eden, set apart forever from sin, death, and the devil. Look, we don't have to be antagonistic about this. We don't have to raise up zealots to go storming into the streets. We don't have to picket City Hall. We just need faithfulness. We need to quit worrying about pensions and pay raises. 
We need to raise up our children in the way that they should go. And if COVID taught you anything, it's that most people can work from home. So wherever people are, they need to find a faithful church and a faithful school. I know you're seeing it at Redeemer, people uprooting their lives and moving. We're seeing it in Coleman too. Start a school. And if you can't, find one and support it. Get on call committees and don't give up. If we've learned anything about being sanctified, made holy, set apart from the Scriptures, it's that just because you're set apart doesn't mean that the enemy gives up. Go back and follow those genealogies. Ishmael wasn't set apart from Isaac, or Isaac wasn't set apart from Ishmael, and then Ishmael just stays gone forever. I mean, his descendants were the ones responsible for taking Joseph into Egypt. And even that wasn't his end. Anyone for the Crusades? What about Esau? He didn't go off and live his happily ever after. His sons were the first enemy that Moses and God's people met outside of Egypt in the Amalekites. And you can go on and on and see that the ones from whom God's people were set apart continued to attack God's people and sought to enslave them. Sometimes we see God's people stand faithfully. Other times, many times, they fall. Evil exists all around us. So I encourage you today to stand firm. Don't change. Whatever the pressure may be to tweak this or to tweak that, to be innovative, don't. All the mouse wants is the cookie. In the end, we wind up with haircuts and sweeping the floor. In today's version, the mouse probably winds up a walrus or something like this, but we won't go there. Learn. Do what? He plays baseball. He plays, oh, does he? Yeah. I saw that. Oh, the, in the actual book. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Learn from the Scriptures. Assimilation with the world never works out. Pretending that we're the same or that we can play their game and somehow kind of remain Christian is foolish. It never works. Inviting any of those things from the world into our midst is inviting those things in that we have been set apart from. Instead, let's do what we do and do it well. Preach the gospel. Administer the sacraments. I know President Harrison wants us to be joyfully Lutheran, but I encourage you to be fearlessly Lutheran. The world needs what we have to give. It's peace. It's the gospel. It's complete Sabbath rest in Jesus. In the face of a world that seems to be spiraling out of control all around us. But let us not forget one of the first songs that many of us ever learned as children. I learned it as a Baptist. Many of you learned it as Lutherans. But in this we can agree. He's got the whole world in his hands. But what I didn't know then, what I know now, is that those hands are pierced with the marks of crucifixion. And in those marks, you have been set apart from the rest. From our preschools to our elementary schools and high schools, even to our Concordias, and very especially to the places we are set apart on Sunday mornings, we must be proclaiming this. We must be living this. This is who God has made us. This is who He has called us to be by His Spirit, His sanctified, His holy, His set apart. If we try to climb the ladder that was on the board, we're only playing the game that the world wants us to play. And we'll not only wind up in competition with the world, but worse off, we'll wind up like the Pharisees or the disciples and in competition with ourselves. 
Instead, we see that we're not of the world at all. That is not our game. That is not who our God is. Instead, He's the one who set you apart from the beginning. These are critical times. You know, it's funny. I I talked to some older guys, and they tell me that, you know, they'll be retired or dead and don't have to deal with this stuff that we've got to deal with in the next many years. And while I, I don't invite chaos and certainly don't have a martyr complex, how boring it must have been to have been a pastor 80 or 100 years ago when it was the culturally appropriate thing to do to come to church. Those were the days when the world was perfectly blended with the church. It was nice and bronzy. But we need men, right, who will take up this task. So you pastors, remain faithful, set apart. Lay people, remain faithful Sundays and through the week. If you have a school, support it. It has been set apart by God. If you don't have one, or are in a situation where you can start one, find one, and support one. If you can't do it financially, do it by prayer. And most of all, no matter how much the world wants to scream that we're progressing to where we've never been before, and that you're on the wrong side of it, don't cower into some fantasy world. Don't be like Saul hiding away, just ready to throw your armor to someone else. We've been here before in the history of the church. The trajectory for the church in the immediate isn't necessarily a good one. But Christ has overcome the world. The church will prevail because He has prevailed, and we are set apart in Him, set apart by His death. And in the end, we will be led to everlasting life. Thanks again for having me. Uh, We've got maybe some time for questions before we do our panel discussion. I still find it amazing that you once the, the, the best of the brightest of, of, of Jerusalem and Judah that, that were taken to Babylon were allowed by the Persians to go back home, there were still a large chunk that said, Matt, nah, we're good. We've got a nice Jewish community here. We can, we can live just comfort, comfortably here. We'll go back and visit for Passover sometime. Oh, that's right. I, you, well, you think, think of Babylon. Even uh, see Jeremiah with these first deportations. You know, Jeremiah says, look, the false prophets, Hananiah, said, oh, it's only going to be two years, you'll be fine. Jeremiah says, no, when you get there, you better start building houses. You're going to be there for a while. But can you imagine, and again, maybe, maybe I'm too sympathetic. I don't want to let Israel off the hook here. But after 70 years, imagine having been two or three years old in that first deportation. Now Cyrus comes along and says, go home, right? He needed a, he needed a faithful friend on the eastern Mediterranean coast. Go home. So now you're 72, 73, and you've got a family, and all your kids and your kids' kids, Cyrus says, go home, and they look and say, well, I am home. This is home. But they had lost this kind of set-apartness. Babylon wasn't their home. It would have been much easier to say that in Egypt, too, 400 years. Um, But as soon as you say, yeah, we'll go back to Passover every now and then, you never go back to Passover. We'll go on Christmas and Easter. One of the ways in which the Lutheran Church is set apart, aside from our our, our gift and blessing of a systematic theology, is that we also hold out the atoning work of Christ to the entire world. All these other Christian denominations um, do not hold out the gospel in that same way. They don't, they don't present that to the world. It's either, well, Jesus died for the saved, or you haven't done enough, or Jesus did part of what you had to do. You can, you can, of course, relate that to all these denominations. We as Lutherans have something very unique, which is the atoning work of Christ is for you. So when you say, 
that to hold out the gospel, that is precisely what we alone do. But at the same time, in our churches, and you, you did a little bit of that to us today as a pastor, and I always think all the Lutheran preaching I've heard all over the world, I can always tell when the pastor is preaching the law and when he's preaching the gospel, because when he's preaching the gospel, he's smiling. And when he's preaching the law, he's not. But it's time to also <laughs> preach the law in our congregations so that people recognize that the mission of the church is to preach the word and administer the sacraments, and their mission is to go into the world and share that holy gospel. We, so often as parishioners, uh, as a layman, and I've seen it happen, we say, well, pastor, that's your job. No, it's my job. It's my job to go and tell so that other people can see that, yes, I, there is value in coming to this church. We're not advertising church. We are convincing people with the holy scriptures that the divine service is for them, too. Thank you. Did you have? Well, <clears throat> um, I was just, you know, I think we fall into this language of preach the gospel, uh, I think, a little too easily. Um, our schools, really, their mission is actually law-based. Right? Right. They're, they're teaching virtue, courage, and wisdom. And uh, what the, the world doesn't attack the gospel directly. Right? Oprah, Oprah will love to talk about Jesus loving and forgiving, especially the fags. You know, I mean, yeah. so it's, uh, this is the... Almost, the almost, oh, I, I'm... I think that was misrecorded. I didn't say what you thought I said. But anyway, <laughs> the, uh, no, I mean, what, what, and I mean, if you look, even like when you're talking, right, I mean, the, the points of distinction are actually in the goodness of the order that God has created and what we need to embrace. So we need to be unashamed of the law right. and, and, and recognize that part the law sets us apart because it is God's eternal will and it is good. And it isn't just some sort of oppressive accusation burden sort of thing, right? School, our school does not, our school does not exist to preach the gospel. No, this is this is a really this is a really really good point because the argument that if you don't let this person in, they won't hear the gospel. Yeah. It's like what what I what I want to do through our school is to teach our boys to be boys and our girls to be girls, yeah. to be virtuous in their lives, and and you, 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 see, you see that through all of the subjects. It's not that we're not going to learn algebra because I've got to teach, you know, right. it's, 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 it's formation. But they're, they're destroying the gospel by destroying the law. Yeah. Right? They're, 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 they it's never, a different gospel. They never come after the gospel directly. Right? They always undermine it by denying who Jesus is in his work and his person. Thomas Jefferson loves the letters written red, right? right. Uh, the Marcionites, I mean, on and on. They're always cutting out, they always pretend to like Jesus. It has to become but a different gospel. It has to be, yeah. That's what, so, so we have to, I think we need to recognize that because I think that's one of the places that we get fooled. The, the other thing is, like when I'm listening to you up there, you know, and you're, you're ranting against all the moral issues in the schools. Every Lutheran elementary school teacher in the Missouri Synod would have been pounded on the table. Yes, yes, that's our school. They, because they'd say, we don't have transgender bathrooms. We don't teach evolution. I think the problem goes deeper. The, the, the problem is, is that how did Concordia, Mech 1, or whatever get to this point? They've been claiming from the beginning and always that they're distinctly Christian and Lutheran and they're about the gospel. But their ideology is indistinct, they, they are just exactly like the public university, except they try to Christianize it. Yeah, they go to chapel. And they brought it, they don't realize that the, this ideology has implications and, it, and it's destroying stuff. And I, you know, so I would, I wouldn't say start a school, I'd say start a classical school. And I mean, I, and I mean, I know that's just like sort of the buzz thing and the faddish thing, but I think we gotta recognize how did we get here? Because all the Lutheran school teachers, they, and, and every church growth pastor, pretty much in the Missouri Synod, would have agreed, I mean, at the surface level with what you're saying. But, but then how did they get there? Right. They, they don't, they're like, look, we, we're, you know, we don't teach evolution, we just sing Amy Grant songs. And Amy Grant songs are Christian. They have no, no impact, there's no false doctrine in them. Yeah, well, there's no true doctrine in them either. Right? So they're not actually rigorous, they're not actually teaching, and that ends up, I don't know if that's... No, I, yeah, that's, I Yeah. You've got to go a little harder. If you're going to be controversial, be controversial. Tough <laughs> 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 I think 
that's a very important <coughs> distinction worth underscoring because for, for decades, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod emphasized so importantly the importance of telling about Jesus. And this infected our schools so much that that became the operative thing in our Lutheran schools. Ultimately, to be telling people about Jesus and to be learning about Jesus, that, that was the crowning thing of our school, but it's not. Right. That is the business of the church. This distinction between the two kingdoms applies between, ultimately, the church and the school. And I think that's well worthy of underscoring. I think that would help us. And that's why the classical school is such a good thing. I think that's absolutely critical. Right. We've, we've, we've recognized this in, in Coleman. You know, we're, we're beginning to shift in the fall because it... The distinction wasn't there. I mean, but on the surface level, right. you would, and, and the, argu the argument against is, oh, we are different because we, you know, we sing matins, we do this, we, you know, we are smaller classes, safe, we are different, but, but ultimately... Well, I, I, I don't know, I don't yeah. know that that's... I mean, in fairness, you, you are so, I mean, it's not like, it, it is different. But, but the problem is, at least now, we can see it isn't a good enough inoculation, right? I mean, of, of course, you know, our Lutheran schools aren't teaching that kind of direct immorality, but they've failed to see the implications of the ideology and, and the uh, pedagogical theory and so forth of this other school. In the same way we're not necessarily teaching it, because of because of maybe some current curriculum issues that are in place, we're also not preparing our children to face it when they leave. So it's like, yeah, we we did our jobs because we didn't teach this, but next year they're going to get it, yeah. and uh, and they're not prepared to face it right. at all. And you know, well, the other thing you didn't say that I would add to this to make it worse is, you know, you need to get out a hot lunch. You need to get out of all the government subsidy stuff. Uh, vouchers. Vouchers for sure. I mean, because again, you're you're allowing. I mean, we. This is what our. This is what Walther and Crowd were. They were dead set against that, because they recognize the influence that the government takes when, when if you if you take their money. So it's a, it's a, what, so I, I like what you're saying. Everybody needs to make sacrifices on this. We got to stop thinking about payroll and pensions. The teachers have to make sacrifices, but they shouldn't make it alone. Right. The parents need to make sacrifices, and the congregations need to make sacrifices. We can't we can't just take the government money, and you know we we've got to do things differently to be set apart. Now, would you push that further and say that we should revoke our own 501c3s? Mm -hmm. No, uh, but we don't get well, why. why? Yeah. I mean, that's a government sure. handout. Well, that's, it, that's it, that is something that they can use. That's to, true. To thumb and press. And well, well, yeah, but I mean, this is always sort of the. Uh, I mean, this this gets into sort of comp. Well, you should answer it. I'm sorry. You're, you're the you're the one that's already started on the trail of controversy. I mean, there's, there I is a distinction between... something we should discuss. I agree, but, but I do think it is, there is, I do think it's a, it's a legitimate distinction uh, between saying, I'm going to utilize the tax code and not pay more taxes than legally required, as opposed to saying, I'm going to take a government handout, right? I mean, there, it is something about saying, I'm not going to just hand over cash from my pocket as a donation to the government that the government doesn't require because it has its own... Look, if it was up to me, we'd have a flat tax because that would be just. I'm, it wasn't my idea to have this idiotic tax code, but I'm not going to pay more than the... I'm not going to give the government more taxes. But at the same time, I'm, I mean, we didn't take the payroll thing from the government. No, no, no. We didn't, I mean, but I'm not going to... Right? How many uh, I think that's tailor a, <laughs> what they speak well, that's, because right. then you've got of... A, Jeopardizing that. Yeah. No. I, well, or and that's a problem. To. Well, and I mean, during COVID, we were threatened with that. No, that's right. I mean, this was when, when, you know, shut down or else. Yeah. Well, we're going to be fined. Yeah. It, right. well, it's not. It's not going to stand. First of all, but right. you know, but that was that was the first thing off people's lips was, well, they're they're going to they're going to fine us if we don't. 
And I, I would say the, the 5013C thing is not, a, is, the other thing is that, you know, we did have, a, there is a history in this country where the government recognized the goodness of the church and the fact that we're raising, you know, we hand over our boys for their wars. You know, we, we produce actually virtuous citizens that are beneficial to the government and, and, and they recognize that. That's why they, they weren't doing well, this because they now. liked us. Well, they don't want to be. Yeah, we just produce the bigots. Yeah, <laughs> well, and that's why they might take it away from us. And I mean, they, they could do that. I mean, you know, or they can, right, they could try. And I mean, we could decide how to respond. But I mean, you know, we could, you know, we can open up our borders and let Putin have us. I mean, if the, the government decides, but. Well, we're 501c3, not because we're churches, because, I mean, the Clinton Foundation is a 501c3. Yeah. We're 501c3 because we're a not-for-profit organization, yeah. and we shouldn't surrender that. No, I wouldn't. Um, just, just for the sake, you know, and now, if it, if it, if it comes to that, <coughs> if, if they start coming after 501c3s, the Clinton Foundation and the churches, if we don't, comp, you know, if we try to force us to compromise our beliefs, then the time will come for that. But I, I think we might be losing focus if we say, hey, let's throw our 501c3 away just right. to show them, you know. <laughs> I mean, but, yeah, you, 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 br you bring this up. These are all, you know, everything eventually is tied together in this way, and we've got we've to be ready. We've got to start having these discussions about if, when, what. Yeah, because yeah, I do think it does speak to the problem of sometimes we worry about the wrong things as pastors, too. And so... How many, you know, you, what you, do, you do still wonder how many churches closed down because maybe they did fear having their tax-exempt status removed, and how much does that affect what is coming out of the pulpit? So I don't, think it's, I don't think it's a moot point by any means, and I think it still does show how being under the thumb of the state uh, in that way does affect what happens in our churches. And so instead of worrying about things like closed communion or what we're actually preaching and teaching or the conduct of the service, we're worried about whether we're going to lose our tax exempt status or 